Um, so hello everyone, it's lovely to see you all here today because today we are focusing around diversity and inclusion. So none of our guests today are specifically maths focused. Um, all of them have experience in working in different ways with diverse audiences and most importantly, ensuring that what they're doing is actually inclusive when they start doing it. So it's something that is really, really important for all of us in all of the things that we do, which is why we really wanted to do a Talking Maths in Lockdown session on it and why I'm so excited about this one in particular. First up, I'd like to introduce Divya and Ellie, who will be discussing a lot of things that they've learned when they're organising access and diversity centred events, such as the space in science, space science in context and how that you can apply these lessons for some of the other things that you're doing. So to introduce them slightly, Divya is a PhD student in planetary science at UCL. She's also a poet, a composer and an event organiser and consultant. Ellie is a researcher in the social studies of outer space. She's finished her PhD focusing on the informal space science education at UCL in the summer of 2020 and she will be continuing her research in the University of Delaware in 2021. So we're glad to nab her while she's still in the country. Um, she's also a science communicator, event organiser and museum tour guide. So Ellie and Divya sent out a or rather I sent out a link to a video that they've made on this topic in particular um, in the welcome email for this event. Some of you may have had a chance to watch that, some of you might not have. It is linked in the chat already so you can go and watch that later and they'll be discussing some of the key points that they brought up in that video about the events that they've run but also what they've sort of learned and built on since then. So I'll hand over to you two. Um, hi everyone, it's really delightful for us to be invited to be here with you, hello. Um, Devia and I uh, hope that you might have got the chance to watch the video that we sent out in advance and um, instead of kind of presenting some of the stuff that we found um, in doing our conference, which is very much in that video, um, and there is uh, lots of links on our website that Divya's just put in the chat to other media, um, journal articles, um, informal publications, podcasts that we've been on. Uh, what we wanted to do today was kind of host a, a kind of question and answer between us to kind of pull back the curtain on um, some of the things that we think were really important in centering diversity and inclusion and, and access in the conference that we organized together. Um, so we have kind of three prompt questions for each other and what we're going to do is we're going to um, use these questions as a springboard for thinking through some of the issues and um, mechanisms that we developed and also want to share with you as a ways of centering inclusion and diversity in your work. Um, Divya, do you think I've introduced this uh, what we're going to be doing well. Yes. Yeah, thanks so much it. for that. Yes. <laughs> okay, perfect. So um, the very first thing we wanted to discuss kind of in an open format with you um, was uh, what supported our project to get it to the point where it worked in the way that it did. So hopefully you've seen in the video some of the successes that we had, but we wanted to think about like what was it about that process that helped us get to that point? Divya, do, is there anything that you thought particularly helped us yeah, get to that point? I think uh, something that that you actually brought up um, when we were talking over this was that, um, so, so just as a quick background for SSIC, in case you didn't see our video, it was a virtual conference held in May that we proposed as virtual before the pandemic. Um, and that was for a number of reasons, mostly because we wanted to pay our speakers well and we wanted to pay for access uh, measures. Um, and so we didn't want to have to also pay for a physical space. And, um, and so part of our proposal was also innovating in the virtual realm, but really centering access, um, centering the diversity of our speakers, et cetera. And I, a big part of that um, in seeing access measures was working with other organizations. And so Ellie, you said something great um, just about half an hour ago of you can't really do this alone. And I think that's, that's really, really um, salient because not only was it just two of us uh, running a conference that ended up being um, having 400 people, which we didn't expect, um, you you can't possibly know everything that uh, that you should be doing or that um, that your attendees will need, and oftentimes that will look like looking to the literature, talking with other people who've uh, who've run events, who've taught um, in the virtual realm, for example, 
and then also working with other organizations. So we, we've built a really good connection with an organization or a company that has done our transcriptions for this conference, but then also has gone on to collaborate with us on other events that we've hosted. Um, and because of that relationship, we've gotten advice on how to get BSL interpreters and how to, how to do better with our captioning and our transcription um, and learning what, what works and what doesn't work. And um, I think that was really important and um, a really good connection to make because again, you can't really know everything. And I think a big part of, of trying to work on inclusivity and accessibility is sort of admitting that you don't know, <laughs> you don't know everything, you can't be perfect and approaching other people. Um, so Ellie, if, if you want to take over. Yeah, that. sure. Yeah. Something that I was thinking about that was really important for the success of both space science in context and then other projects that Divya and I have worked on together. It's also financial support for the project. Um, and we like as somebody who does a lot of science communication, I recognize that often this is really hard to come by and we kind of, um, I guess, often think about doing things on a shoestring. Um, and I've recently reviewed a whole bunch of grants for a, a learned society that I won't name. Um, but it's interesting to me that like, even when people are offering money um, for people to do events, so a large, a large sum of money to run a public engagement project, um, very little of that money was being allocated towards anything that we might consider to be diversity and inclusion. Um, in particular, not like anything to do with making virtual conferences more accessible and if you I think there's a there's a there's a thing that's like if you don't have that money then I understand how like that might slip and I don't think that's necessarily right but I understand how that might happen but I think we don't center enough in the discussions that we do have about science communication and setting up projects and running them um how important it is to to budget for this stuff like you can't expect to not pay somebody to do BSL interpreting you can't expect to not pay somebody to make sure that you're captioning works properly or um somebody to kind of manage or run a website so that it's accessible in a in a way to your participants um and especially in the cases of like asking for you know like 10 to thirty thousand pounds worth of money for running science communication events i think that that we need to like normalize within the work that we all do putting aside a portion of that money for access and obviously in the digital space that access looks different to um, it's something in the in the physical space, but I think it's interesting that the conversation around diversity and inclusion and access often sees it as like an add on to an existing event rather than like a bedrock. Um, and so like, yeah, we might have people who come to our event who are deaf, but like that's an add on rather than something from the ground up. We're not making this event so that it definitely has BSL in interpreters or so that it definitely have ca has captioners. That's something we'll have to like scrimp in the budget later if that's a need that somebody has. And so I think that there's like maybe a really important shift that we all need to normalize in, in the field of, of, you know, STEM communication more generally, that is to push that kind of, um, yeah, centering of, of financial commitment. And that's like Divya said as well, not only just around access, but also around paying speakers, paying people to to come and give labor. So we asked people to pre-record and then also attend a live session. And we wanted to pay people for both of those, both of those things. And so that I think is really important as well. Um, yeah. Is there anything else that you want to talk about on the support side? Yeah, I think um, maybe just in conclusion, the the idea of uh, especially for for thinking about virtual conferencing and also improving diversity and inclusion, um, we can't try to replicate what we've already done. We can't really try to replicate the status quo. So I think a lot of error has happened with a lot of say large conferences in. So my field is the geosciences and and astronomy of where conferences have just sort of shifted online and kept the same sort of infrastructure. Um, and if your conferences were already exclusive or your events were already exclusive, or maybe you are still you know, improving as we all are on how to center access that you can't really copy and paste um, uh, events. And I think that's something that Ellie and I also are trying, <laughs> trying to be careful of, of where we definitely uh, try to build on previous uh, successes, but also you have to make room for the lessons that you learn and um and that so centering uh diversity inclusion and accessibility really comes from 
sort of stepping back and looking at what kind of lessons you can learn um, on how to do that. Uh, and that's it for me. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, um, our second like prompt question for our discussion was um, what was, in our opinion, the biggest success of doing this project in this way? What did we get from this project that maybe wouldn't have happened if we hadn't set up the event in this way that really centered access, diversity and inclusion? So Divya, for you, what was the biggest success of our project? I I think for me, um, and I've said this multiple times, just being a disabled person who was really passionate about like making a conference that was really welcoming to people. Um, so we, we did a poll of our attendees and 24% uh, of them reported being disabled, chronically ill or neurodivergent. Um, so for perspective in the US and the UK, about 20 to 25% of society is disabled, whereas only about three to 4% of academics are disabled maybe 10% of postdocs uh, from a recent report. Um, so access has a really huge impact. And I think the fact that we also advertised the access. So again, that, that was really important. So rather than tacking it on or, um, you know, in your welcome e email, you might have a PS and say like, if you have access issues, email us, which is always good. Um, but actually being really upfront and saying like, we are trying to do our best and we wanna make it welcoming. Um, and that being the opening of our event launch and our registration and making that really, really clear explicitly over and over again that we will support you. And that's the point of our event, um, I think really had a good impact. And so that was really exciting to see. Um, we also had some other numbers. We had 64% of the attendees were women and 10% were non-binary. Um, about 69% uh, of our attendees were, uh, were, did not identify as heterosexual. Um, and we had, uh, we had a lot of really good qualitative, uh, responses as well with that, um, which Ellie, you can talk about 80% of respondents felt like we had supported their needs. So there was still a big gap and there's a lot to learn from that gap. Um, but that was really great. And a lot of people, I think also were impacted with how to see and think about how to be creative with virtual events in the future, which was, um, a good lesson for us as well. Thanks, Ellie. Yeah, um, so I, my, my, like, for me, the biggest success was the range of people that we had as speakers. And something that was really important to me was uh, when we when we started uh, kind of seeking out these uh, people. And like Divya says, obviously, we are learning as we go forward. We realized that when we had selected all these speakers, we had a really like Eurocentric and America centric bias. And so when we run this again, we really hope to expand further and and draw like more strongly from um, the global south in terms of the speakers that we invite to talk. Um, but we really emphasized the fact that like there is super important especially in something like space science where we're increasingly looking at kind of a discussion that goes well beyond like individual nations or individual groups of people that it's it's really seen to be i guess as broad range of people as possible included in that discussion and so we selected people from a range of different ethnicities and genders um, a range of locations although as i said like maybe we didn't reach as far away from the global south as we wanted um, disabilities um, and one thing that was really exciting was to see this reflected both in the in the qualitative feedback we got from our attendees but also in the makeup of the attendees so mm -hmm. what we found was that the makeup of the people who responded with demographic data um, to our attendees kind of matched fairly well the makeup of the panel uh, of speakers. So we had, for example, like a 10% of non-binary people and this echoed kind of the composition of our, of our speaker set as well. So it was exciting to see that like by inviting those people to be the invited speakers, people in, felt like they could come and we saw a similar representation in the in the in the people who were attending attending as participants and so i just have one quote here and it, this is somebody writing in our feedback form who said as a woman of color this is the first time i've attended a conference and not felt like i was in a minority this was such a lovely feeling so thank you for setting up such a diverse and welcoming conference next time i see a conference lineup which is made up of all white men I can point out ssic to show them that diverse lineup of speakers is possible and there's lots more in this kind of ilk where we saw people being able to respond honestly in the feedback and say that this had really echoed their experience. And that was really exciting for me um, in, in terms of the success for our conference. So I'm aware that we have like three minutes to wrap up our discussion, but um, this kind of 
it builds quite nicely. So the final question that we had for our Q&A was, what would we like to improve next time or in an event that we organized again? So Divya, what would you like to improve or what do you think we could improve on? <laughs> so much. Um, I think <laughs> we were just talking that Ellie and I send each other like new papers on best practice for events like constantly. Um, I think things we can improve on are probably um, I think there's always something to learn about how to be better accessible and how to be more proactive with uh, attendees to figure out their needs um, it can be really, really difficult. Um, and also working with uh, the different types of platforms that exist, all of which have their own uh, quirks, so to speak. Um, and I think, yeah, I think in the future, I think um, really working hard to make sure that people feel comfortable enough to attend is something that, that always needs work where, um, you know, having diverse speakers helps uh, diversify attendees quite a lot, but then you also have to make sure that other things sort of in the in the space feel comfortable to people to really correct the course that we've gone on in, in STEM where, um, where people feel uncomfortable or feel like there's a hostile uh, environment. And so I think that's, that's a really important component of diversity. You don't want to just reflect what society looks like, but you also want to course correct the active exclusion of specific people over time, which often looks like over-representing over those groups rather than just uh, proportionally representing those groups. So I think that's that's something that we can always improve on. How about you, Ali? Yeah, so I was just thinking while you were talking that actually, and, and I've mentioned a couple of things that I think we could improve on, but something that we noticed was between people who signed up for the registration like signed up for the email alert that we were opening registration and the people who registered we lost quite a significant number of people who I would describe as being like the hegemonic type of scientists so typically like tenured or professors and um, lectureship white men from the global north and there was a like quite a, like not that we uh, then mostly people that I know who maybe didn't sign up or people that we're aware of in the public in the public sphere and so um, something that I think maybe would be a good point to work on is that like although this is a really important space for making people in like feel more included and giving a, a space for this discussion and um, it's important that it it's not just people who already sign up to the idea that diversity and inclusion is important who are part of that discussion, um, but that like more people are there so that it reaches, I guess, further into the groups of people who weren't already committed to this to this cause or this, this um, project. And because there are lots of people who don't believe this is important. And I think it's really, it is really vital that those people are also part of seeing this discussion, seeing these fantastic speakers that we have being part of an event that centers access, diversity and inclusion to know that it is possible. And, and that's something I think that we need to like think about, which is difficult because it's hard to hold that against like making sure that that space is inclusive and not hostile and doesn't reproduce the problems of the field. And so that's like genuinely quite a difficult problem. And I think there's, there's reasons why we prioritize this being a space that was not like that was yeah, supported the people that it did. And perhaps, yeah, it's it's something to reflect on. And I'm, I, I am, as you can hear in my discussion, unresolved about how this works out. Um, but yeah, I don't know if you have any final comments, Divya? No, I think I think that's really it. Besides that, uh, that's always the big question in diversity work, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Brilliant. Well, thank you both so much. That was really, really interesting and really useful. Um, I am aware that Ellie has to run off to go and do some teaching uh, fairly soon. So where is Ironically, we... teaching maths. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so getting all the maths, give, give Ellie all the maths vibes. Um, but where we would normally save all the questions for the end, we are going to have about five minutes or so now if anyone has questions that they would like to ask before she runs away. Divya, are you hanging, uh, be able to hang about or are you heading off as well? So Divya is going to be here, um, but in case you wanted to catch Ellie in particular, does anyone have any questions? Remember, you can stick them in the chat if you don't want to say them out loud or send them to one of the organisers privately if you don't want to ask them publicly. There is a hand up from Fran. Hello, Fran. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> 
It's okay. No problem. I didn't put my real hand up instead of just the virtual one. Thank you very much. And um, it was really interesting. And thank you for sending. Uh, I thought it was a nice parallel that you'd talked in your video about the reverse flipped classroom. And that's kind of what you've done with us today, saying, here's the stuff that you can go away and now ask the useful questions about it. Can I ask if you've got any pointers for those of us who are freelance and maybe don't have any budget at the moment for access for things like I you I noticed the transcription service you talked about earlier what would you advise I am not I, so I've done a bit of BSL but there's absolutely no way actually maybe it would slow down how fast I talk if I could only say things that I can also sign at the same time but I was thinking about how what advice would you give those of us who would like to offer a transcription service or subtitles but maybe don't have a budget for it at the moment where would you point us Divya, do you want to take this? Sure, I think there are a few options. So I think um, especially since the pandemic, there's been a really good uh, turn with technology where, um, for example, there's the app otter.ai where attendees can either have that plugged into, I think Zoom supports it, or if you're using something like Teams, you just have it on your phone um, that can provide captions for, uh, for attendees. And I think it generates a transcript as well. Um, I've done a bit of captioning myself. I know it's it is labor intensive. Um, so for about a, a 12 minute video, it might take about 45 minutes and I type very quickly, um, where you can use something like YouTube, which is free to use and it uh, will auto sync your typed captions to the video in a really, really slick way. Uh, not to praise Google, but um, it is pretty good and will also give you a transcription that you can download. Um, so there are some like free uh, services in that way. Um, I think it depends like how much time you also have to, to input that kind of labor that is probably also unpaid. Um, so it is a bit tricky. I think it is improving. And I think um, things like Otter are really, really amazing where um, I think you can also like share that transcription afterwards with people. It gives you a unique link. Um, so yeah, again, there, there are those, those little things. And I think also importantly is just to be honest with your attendees. So say like we are relying on these things, but it's not perfect. And I think that honesty goes a really long way and is much better than just sort of like not saying anything and people showing up and being like, oh, hey, where's the access? Um, yep. And so I think, yeah, the honesty has to be like the core part of that, if that helps. Brilliant, thank you very much. And on that note, I'll, I'll add to that, that you'll notice we don't have subtitles, um, mainly because we have been trying to work out an option that we can afford. Um, but we have subtitles on all the YouTube links and we won't upload until we've got the subtitles on there. I think the last couple of videos have gone up with the auto generated ones, but they will go back and be improved. It does take a very long time. Um, it takes days of your life um, to, to tweak the subtitles and you'd be surprised how many alternative versions of the word maths there are um, that are auto-generated on your subtitles. Um, one thing that you can do if you're presenting during a session, as Ben has pointed out in the chat and a couple of people have mentioned as well, PowerPoint and Google Slides and possibly some other options as well, if those aren't your preferred, um, will provide automatic subtitles from a live slideshow. So they're not perfect, they're prone to errors, but they are better than nothing if you are presenting slides as well as talking. Does Keynote do that as well? I'm not a Mac user, so I can't confirm I... or deny that. I don't think I haven't seen it, but I yeah. also have not upgraded my computer in a really long time because I'm worried. <laughs> um, my dad works like with a lot of like Apple syndication and he's always like, just wait. He like tells me he's like, now upgrade it. They fixed out the bugs. Um, so I'm, I'm waiting for the sign off, but well, I don't we know. All, if... We all need someone that wise to advise us on that. <laughs> exactly. Um, I, I will think... also say. Oh, sorry. No, go no, ahead. You go, Divya. I was just going to say that um, the transcription company that we use also does like discounts, especially for like minority led events or targeted events. Um, so uh, I think people are also really nice and, and aware of, of these things. So I'm going to just link. Um, I think I don't think that they have a website, but I'll link their Twitter as well because they're fantastic. I also just like I know we've talked specifically about stuff to do with live events, but also important to think about like things that you might be putting out as resources. So, for example, alt text on images, making sure that your um, documents are screen reader accessible, and particularly if it's like a PDF that it like runs in a way that is sensible for a computer to read the document. Um, and again, lots of things like Google Slides have add-ons that will tell you if your um, 
if your presentation is screen reader accessible, we'll check that all of the images have alt text and we'll show you like the way that it's going to read it as well. Um, so things like that also not just like not just thinking about live events but thinking about like all parts of the the project everything from how you're sending out the email how you're producing resources that you might be sharing after the event how you might be talking about it on social media um and yeah so all of these things are important when you're thinking about access that and like doing some you know making an effort with some of these um is is, is as important as making an effort with others so it's not just about the actual the live event itself as well. Um, one thing I'll add on BSL interpretation, if you are planning to have a signer uh, do interpretation, whether it's it's live or, or pre recorded, um, do provide them with a transcript if you can. If you don't have time to write out everything you're saying, key vocabulary is really, really important. Um, you don't have there, there aren't as many signs as there are words in the English language, particularly technical language. Mm. And signers are, the BSL users are still developing signs for, for very technical things and things like that. So your interpreter might need to go and look stuff up or might need to go back to the root of the meaning of a word in order to find a sign that works for it, particularly if with a lot of scientific vocabulary, spelling it wouldn't be over that help, overly helpful. Um, so yeah, it's a good. Mm -hmm point there lovely well i would say thank you hugely again to divya and ellie um ellie feel free to stay for as long as you like or to run away and prepare for for the things that you are doing um but thank you very very much and thank you divya. thank you for having us yeah thanks so much we're really excited to be here with you all so yeah thank you so much and like uh, i think in the chat um somebody has linked our websites feel free to get in touch with us online um or via the organizers or just independently online we're around for chats and um yeah enthusiastic about this so we're excited thank you for having us brilliant thank you both um next up we have lewis hugh lewis is a public and community engagement public yeah public and community engagement specialist particularly interested in interdisciplinary disciplinary learning and approaches which build equitable and meaningful relationships with diverse groups, support social justice and challenges institutional hierarchies. He's the director of Science Cayley. He's a member of the Anti-Racist Educator Collective and helps run the Equity at Excite community of practice. Lewis works really closely with a variety of community groups in Scotland and he'll be discussing his work on that and around anti-racism and decolonisation, which is why we've asked him to come along and share with us today. So I'll hand over to you, Lewis. Thanks very much. Actually, I was just about to say I was one of the reasons I did use slides is because of the um, transcript, which I always find uh, the captions helpful for everybody, um, especially even if for people who English as a second language, for example. So I am going to share slides just to keep me right. Um, and um, yeah, I'm really, really pleased to be here and see some familiar faces and some different faces as well. Um, so uh, I was going to talk about STEM engagement and social justice with the M highlighted, of course, uh, in this context, um, originally coming from a, a more neuroscience background, which means, of course, historically, I hated maths. Uh, no, that's not true. But um, <laughs> and we do do some engagement within um, maths engagement and interdisciplinary learning with Science Cayley. Um, and actually, we just had a session with some teachers across the Highlands around decolonizing and maths in particular came up as a, as a, a discussion point. So it's really timely. Um, I'm really delighted to be here. Um, I guess I, I kind of wanted to talk a wee bit more about ge generics to begin with and thinking a little bit about principles and the questions, because I feel like a lot of this work, especially as Sam was talking about in terms of actually you know, we talk about diversity, inclusion, and equity, but the building into social justice and um, is a, a lot about mindset more so than it is about any necessarily individual, you know, certainly ticks box kind of approaches. And I think it's about what kind of questions we ask. And a real question I've been really asking myself a lot. Um, we've always been an organization which has set up to, to go beyond the converted and work, work with communities who aren't necessarily, um, represented and, and aren't privileged and, and, and are marginalized in many different ways. Um, that's how we set up six or seven years ago, so originally as a project and now as a social enterprise. And we always talk about this importance of building trust. 
And of course, that's particularly important now around COVID and we know mistrust in science is, is really key. But over the last probably one or two years, we've been really maybe analyzing this approach as well. So obviously, building trust can have lots of different approaches. We talk a lot about broadening what counts and who should count. Um, so people who are familiar with science capital or STEM capital will know that this is a really common approach. So we know, for example, within our engagement, it's not just about um, making things fun. It's not just about making things accessible. It is absolutely who and what messages we're, about, we're kind of we're, we're counting and broadening what people's understanding of STEM and maths is because very often even if they might enjoy maths activities if it doesn't relate to what they value and to what their friends and families value um, it may not necessarily lead to um, a connection with maths in particular it's a very temporary thing and it's something that I think the STEM engagement um, community have started to grapple with with the work of Emily Dawson and, 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 and people like that um, and of course, for us, it's all about being rooted in community relationships. For us, you know, our old saying used to be, if you build a relationship, the engagement will follow. And I think, you know, let's just, especially when we're, we're producing work and especially online, where we have to be even more intentional about what we put out there in this myriad of, activ of, of just stuff that is out there, is that we just have to know, you know, if we're preachers of the converted, um, there's, there's to a certain degree a place for that, but also acknowledging there are lots of people who are left out in, in that type of work. And so you have to be really intentional about how we build those relationships. Uh, and then, of course, we, you know, we've been talking about diversity, inclusion and equity for a very long time, uh, potentially too long, and nothing very much has changed. And of course, over the last um, few years, I guess, I'm starting to really develop my consciousness, both as um, a person of color and as queer and thinking actually and allowing myself to actually understand where those boundaries are uh, and, and how actually looking at things from a more anti-racist or more decolonial mindset can be really helpful and actually that kind of came to this question of building trust about science is actually well is that trust really earned we always measure public trust in science and it's actually well historically speaking we science and the institutions around science and stem have have privileged a certain type of person and that person uh, and and that has led to years generations of exclusion of different groups and can we really be surprised when people do not trust these institutions and communities do not trust these institutions and so actually as much as of course on a project level on, on in terms of the work that we do it is absolutely about building trust and we very much believe in that there is also the identification of and and, and this broader societal issue that we need to earn our trust as well as institutions and as organizations and as individuals and recognizing our relative privileges so even for myself i have many privileges as cis as not being um, black, for example, and so I benefit from um, from lots of different privileges and being able to recognize that and, and position myself in a way that truly uh, tries to deconstruct some of those things. And so I suppose what I'm trying to say is if we want to build trust, we need to clear our own house and get our house in order, basically. And how do we do that? And I think Part of that is around those hierarchies as well. So a lot of our work has been in culture. So actually most of my work now, I've kind of gone the other direction for a lot of people and gone straight, uh, fully into um, cultural democracy work and action research over the last five years. That's been the, the majority of our, our focus. And that's really not just think, thinking about what we what you might call um, democ so you've got democratization of culture so that's a that's almost like the access model so we have this amazing arts and culture and science and let's how do we broaden and do outreach but actually cultural democracy tries to um, to, to break that down a little bit further and actually invert it and say well why do we have these hier hierarchies to begin with how do we value the different skills and knowledge and different ways of knowing that communities they themselves have and I think that they're not completely incompatible. I think there's overlaps between them because if we value the work that communities have and the, and the expertise and the interests and their different pathways to understanding maths and how it might be relevant in their lives, it can then develop trust to in, uh, in the long term and hopefully properly earn trust um, with, the, with the other different models of, of engagement. 
So it's for me, it's about changing that question of not just what's, what counts, but what is fundamentally valued. And I think that's a mind shift set that we as engagers very often have to really challenge ourselves with again. And we talk about the deficit model and it's not just about, you know, there are, there's absolutely a place for experts and people doing lectures. There's absolutely a place for that, but we need to look at the broader ecology and see, do we fundamentally respect people's um, own, where they're coming from? And then I suppose when it comes to relationships and projects, then actually for us, it's about thinking about, well, actually, how does that feed towards social justice um, in and of itself as well? And um, I'll, I'll break that down a little bit more into, into the next slide. Um, and then finally, of course, we're talking about decolonizing. And I think it's one of those terms that's bandied about a lot. And, and um, David Losaga had a great definition, which I just think is so powerful. And I'm paraphrasing what he said, but it's just, it's basically making sure that everybody's story is told and recognizing how narrowly we viewed the world. And I think for me, that's just such a powerful phrase. And, and I think, of course, when we talk about racism, when we talk about prejudice, we talk about homophobia or transphobia, we think a lot about interpersonal. But when we look at things from a critical race theory perspective or a broader theory, it's, it's whilst interpersonal is powerful and of course, um, very, very immediate, we have to look at the systemic and the structural um, kind of how this is built up. And the best way to think about that is even if we removed all kind of individual prejudice with a magical wish the next day, there are still systems in place in terms of how we organize the world that would still oppress certain people. So it's not to do with individuals. And examples around that is abound within academia. So we think about, well, why do we think about, well, I mean, base 10, right? There's a historical context to that. And of course, there's lots of reasons why it's the case, but it's not culturally universal. But then in, in other fields that I'm, I'm passionate about, for example, the classic example is, why is there music and then there's world music, right? So music, which is invariably classical, uh, you know, European traditions, and then you have world music, which is everything else. You know, so it's the way we divide our world. We have history and then we have, you know, Middle Eastern studies and we have North American studies and Asian studies. But, you know, history is, is centered on a certain tradition. And so for us, it's not absolutely about it's not about removing that history, but it's, it's recognizing that a lot of that history has not been told. And I'm looking at time and I need to go a little bit faster, but that's OK. So. Um, that's why I think, I suppose, I'll think a little bit about, I'll talk a little bit about examples of what that means in practice, but I think that's really where the mindset is so important. And, and in this case, we're always learning. We are always learning. Uh, we are always finding different ways to make sure that we're allying in intersectional ways, and we're always going to make mistakes. But it's thinking about, well, what actually, when I'm presenting some science engagement or maths engagement, what stories are not being told? And it's not always about necessarily, um, and what's really important is not just about the negative stories as well. Of course, we can talk about how the historical, um, how histor historical slavery has affected and completely shaped modern day uh, science and the racism of, around science as well. We can talk about that, but why don't we also talk about black excellence as well and talk about the, 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 the richness that is in, in different cultures and different stories that are not being told. And I think that's a really important slant. It is not about victimhood. It is about embracing these wider stories. It's not just about thinking about who's being represented in, in terms of your pictures, in terms of your examples, but actually thinking about actually um, what stories could be um, doing the research and finding what stories could present alternative world understanding. Um, oh, oh yeah, there you go. In my, in my, there's a little bit of snazzy PowerPoint animation there. All right, last minute. Um, I want to talk about this in terms of practicalities. Um, so I'm going to leave. I've been doing a little bit of reading, especially on the maths, because it was brought up um, with a teacher. And it's something that we're really fascinated by with Science Cayley developing some resources in the long term, hopefully, if we can find funding. And so for us, there's some really great scholarship in, in education around critical engagement in maths and maths for social justice. And I'm going to signpost it to some resources and some great scholarship that happens. But I really like the way that they've con conceptualized this. So thinking about, well, critical engagement maths happens on three different levels. So you're thinking about through maths. So how can students, how can communities engage um, critically in maths through maths? So actually, how can um, they develop and lead their own activities that are meaningful to themselves? How can maths, the second one is with, so how can maths actually empower communities to actually understand and ideally even better um, make action against the social, cultural and economic political issues? So we know that maths are, and statistics and Econ economics 
oppresses people and the misunderstanding in terms of like credit, in terms of debt, in terms of all these type of things um, have a real life impact on especially the most marginalized. And so actually how can maths be a tool to actually critically reflect and actually make action? And the final one, which I discussed just before, is, is on. So critical reflecting on maths and thinking a little bit and depicting and thinking about this decolonial question. So what is the nature? What's the relative privileged positions? And it's not always privileged. It, it, it can differ in different ways. Who is being reflected, but reflecting on it as a field in itself. And what is maths? How do you define it from a more philosophical concept? I'm going to stop there. Um, because I'm out of time, but um, I'm going to leave. I'm going to copy these um, signposts, um, and I'll welcome any questions at the very end as well. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Yeah. Thank you so so much, Lewis. So we are going to move swiftly on to our next speakers, um, and as as Lewis said, we'll have time for all the questions at the end. Um, there is so much to say on all of these things, and we are trying to keep it as. Um, concise as possible if anyone needs to leave with the traditional cutoff at five but as we've said we will be recording if you do have to go before we quite get to the end. Um, next I would like to introduce Andy Clark he's the STEM ambassador hub manager based at the National Science and Media Museum in Bradford he's been involved in a range of projects working with communities local to the heart of Bradford and is currently planning for when visitors will be able to visit the museum again, hopefully in the not too distant future, um, as well as doing things in a more virtual or remote engagement. So he'll be giving us some of his top tips on engaging with diverse audiences, both inside and outside the museum. Andy. Great. Well, thank you very much for inviting me again. Um, I've been amazed by the speakers so far. And uh, and I know what of what of what Lewis uh, said especially uh, resonates with me uh, personally and professionally. And um, I, I'm not going to be as academic. I'm just going to give you some practicalities and things that we've done and things that we have realised. So uh, first of all, let me just kind of introduce myself because this might seem a little bit complicated. Um, in the previous in my slide. Behind me, it says, you know, Andy Clark, Hub Manager, West Yorkshire, STEM Ambassador, Hub Manager, West Yorkshire. And that's uh, what I do. Uh, but I am actually employed by the Science and Media Museum uh, in Bradford. And so um, I work very closely with the learning department within the Science and, and Media Museum. Um, just to kind of give you a, a flavor of, of, of what I do and then how it all ties in. So I look after STEM ambassadors, um, science, technology and engineering and maths ambassadors. They come from all walks of life, all disciplines, um, all backgrounds, and um, they have a, a variety of jobs. And, and my job basically is to put industry and schools together so that um, young people uh, in schools can actually appreciate and see the myriad of jobs that are out there in terms of, of, of STEM um, um, vocations, uh, but also to recognize that these these jobs are open to them. And we, have a, we do have a, a skills shortage here in the UK at the moment and uh, moving forward, um, we've got Brexit coming up um, we've got the COVID-19 um, pandemic going on and these things can have, can um, um, and will um, exacerbate injustices that we see in the education system. So um, as I said to you before, um, I am uh, employed by the Science and Media Group um, uh, some of you will know the Science um, uh, Science Museum in London. I am part of that group, but I'm, I'm based at the National Science and Media Museum in Bradford. And I guess the first thing I would say in terms of science engagement is this. Um, what's going on in the world? Keeping your ear to the ground uh, and being aware of community. And um, here uh, you will see on this slide, I've got um, the BAME Forum. 
Um, this is a, a forum that we started back in June. Um, it was a response to the death of George Floyd in the in, George Floyd in the United States, but also um, um, as a response to the disproportionate deaths of of BAME people in um, hospital due to uh, the COVID nineteen pandemic. And this has been by far a really successful um, um, you know, forum. It's been successful for the museum. It's been successful for our STEM ambassadors and for STEM learning that we work with, because it's allowed people to really think for the first time in many instances about what, it's, what it is, what it means to be a BAME person. Um, and um, I said this morning in our meeting, in fact, that what we're seeing now is um, people who sympathised with us before, which is great, but now those people, with the with the time of ref of reflection that we've got at the moment, those people are now empathising with us and walking in our shoes, and I, I really appreciate that. So um, the Science Museum Group recognizes that the BAME Forum is going on, and I'm saying to them, this is what's going on in the world at the moment. So, you know, when you are engaging with um, different populations, think about what's going on in the world, think about them. The Science Museum Group has um, a value called Open for All. And um, it, it took that value quite seriously prior to this pandemic. Now it's taking this value extremely seriously. And that involves um, um, equity, um, access and inclusion, and um, bringing forward uh, and bringing into the spotlight um, conversations on diversity, uh, inclusion, um, unconscious bias, uh, allyship, and, th and those things which those phrases and those concepts which were around before but have really come to the fore now because of, of, of where we are in terms of the world. Okay, and another thing that we've started doing recently because we've been listening is um, concentrating on neuro and physical diversity and we have a forum for that as well where uh, young people and employers in particular can actually talk about um, how they um, uh, interact with um, people in this category. We use different ways of communicating. Now, I, I fully accept that we have some way to go on this and, you know, um, in terms of, of sign language and um, other ways of communicating, we need to kind of like get on top of that. You know, we are a work in progress. But nonetheless, uh, one of the things that we've done during the Bradford Science Festival, which I'll talk to you about in a second, is actually have pictures of our STEM ambassadors. And this is a particular uh, STEM ambassador, Dr. Colvin de Panisar. And um, what happened was the Oldham Play Action Group, or a very talented group of, of artists came along and drew her um, literally as she spoke on on a on a canvas, and and this is um, uh, a replication of the canvas here. And then we distributed this to schools as well. So rather than a STEM ambassador going into a school and talking, which obviously can't happen really at the moment because of the pandemic, this has worked really really well. Taking this into a school, or sending it to a school, and say you can base a lesson around this. Okay, so working with the community on your doorstep. One of the things that we've recognized in Bradford is that um, as a science museum, we need to work a lot closer and a lot better with our local community. So as you may or may not know, um, the population of Bradford is probably 25 to 30 percent southeast asian in origin and we fully recognize that now and we are looking for ways in which to engage the community and we've had um exhibits in the museum 
based on the community, but we want to bring the, that community in. We want the museum to be a focal point for the community moving forward when all of this COVID business has, has gone. So we are actually working with uh, the community on, on the on doorstep. And one of the great things that we've done is the Bradford Science Festival. So we sponsor the Bradford Science Festival. Um, the learning team uh, works to put this, the festival together. Um, last year, 2019, we had something like 35,000 people attending over a two day period in the middle of Bradford in the summer. Um, obviously, we couldn't do that this year. It was much pared down. But what we did, we we set up uh, ways in which uh, young people could uh, take part by writing blogs, uh, by um, sending out those pictures that I showed you before, uh, by uh, STEM ambassadors doing radio interviews. So we kind of like did that again, not ideal, obviously, but better than nothing at all in, in our opinion. So we are, again, very, very conscious about working with our community. And um, I'm hoping that uh, we can do that again this summer, although of course we don't know where we'll be, but I hope that we'll be in a slightly better position than we are right now. And we recognize role models. And this, uh, in, especially in terms of the STEM ambassador program, is a critical way of actually working with our uh, diverse audiences and our diverse groups of, of, of students. Because we want STEM ambassadors um, who look like them to go into schools and to simply say to those young people, if I can do it, you can do it. And that is such a powerful message. Um, and, you know, it, it, it works in terms of, of race, but it works in terms of neurodiversity, it works in terms of just literal background. Um, if I can do it, you can do it. And that is, uh, again, as I say, a really powerful message and so we need STEM ambassadors who are willing to go into schools and to talk to young people between the ages of 5 and 19 uh, to actually um, discuss um, um, uh, different options within STEM careers. So that really is um, in essence what we do. There's so much more that I could talk about uh, but I recognize also some of the great work that that uh, people in this forum here that I've been listening to uh, some of the great work that, that you've done um, so I want to thank you for your time um, I'm happy to answer any questions and if I can't answer them um, I will go away and make sure they get answered for you so thank you very much for your time Thank you very, very much, Andy. Um, it was great to hear about all the things that you're doing as well. You're welcome. Uh, time is marching on, so I will um, introduce our final speaker for today. Unfortunately, we were due to have um, Sam Langford join us as well to talk about his um, experience on building and maintaining a platform for a diverse group of presenters for both the Global Science Show and Science is a Drag. He can't be with us. I think Sarah will be covering slightly, touching slightly on some of the things that he might have said, um, but we will have a document that we'll put together after this session with top tips that we're collecting from everything that anyone said today. And we'll ask him if he's able to, to contribute to that as well. So without further ado, I will um, introduce Sarah Cosgriff. She is a science communicator based in the UK and has considerable experience of presenting science shows and delivering designing hands-on activities and embedding inclusive practice into science engagement. She's also been a trainer for six years and is passionate about building learners' confidence in communicating science and developing their own unique methods of engagement. So Sarah is going to discuss her experiences of delivering science communication training in an inclusive environment. So particularly the benefits of providing support and things to consider when offering people help when they're building their own sort of science and math communication skills. So Sarah. Thank you, Sam. And I just wanted to first of all say uh, what great speakers we've had so far. Um, so thank you. It's, it's been so interesting to listen to you all. Um, so yes, um, as Sam mentioned, I am a trainer. 
I love being a trainer. It's why I've been doing it for so long in lots of different jobs. Um, I'm a freelancer now, um, as well as working for the Institute of Physics. Um, so as a freelancer, I tend to uh, provide science communication training to uh, people who are like, say, researchers. Um, but I also do a little bit within my role at the Institute of Physics doing CPD for teachers. Uh, I've also trained youth workers, so people who don't come from a STEM background on how to do STEM activities. So uh, yeah, a whole broad range of people. And yeah, one of the reasons why I love delivering training is to build people's confidence. It's so great to get people right at the start of the session where they are then and just leaving with like a bit more confidence, actually kind of knowing where they would like to go next with the skills and knowledge that I've passed on to them. Um, if we think about why training is important or why support is important in general, we can start thinking about how people start doing STEM communication in the first place. So for me, uh, if I go back um, to going back eight years ago, um, I did little things like doing Fame Lab or signing up to be a STEM ambassador. It's all the kind of things where you know someone who then you then help out on that event or that day. And it'll tend to be through that, that leads on to the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. Um, and at the moment, that is quite challenging to have because we aren't really having public events. So, um, and then the other thing is in terms of accessing training, it's quite, I found it's quite inconsistent in, let's say at universities for researchers in terms of what support is available or actually researching knowing that support is available for them. So um, I find that there'll be researchers who may actually want to do some kind of engagement, but don't necessarily know how to get started and training actually potentially bridging the gap there. Um, so I try to think about training could be a way in which we can support people into engagement, but also hoping to get um, a more diverse range uh, of people uh, actually participating in STEM communication. So me as somebody who's a, a science communicator and something I do as a job, I want to see more people like myself do what I or what I do, but uh, but also just being within my sector. Um, and that's something I would personally want, but also for those who like to do STEM communication on let's say the side of their PhD, um, them being able to do that. I should say, just to add to this, that people who are from underrepresented groups are more likely to be asked to do things because they're from underrepresented groups. I mean, women engineering as a as a class as an example, I kept seeing um, when I used to work in a university outreach team. Um, so I should mention that, that we shouldn't burden them with that. But at the same time, there are people uh, from a broad range of backgrounds who are interested in doing some kind of STEM communication. Um, some of them actually interested as a career or just might want to do it. So in terms of the ways I've been doing this over the let's say last, um, I guess the last year, um, I uh, worked a little bit with Sam Langford. Um, so as Sam mentioned, um, he uh, founded and uh, runs this thing called The Global Science Show. It takes place uh, once a month uh, on Twitter. And the idea is that you have a 10 minute slot to post something. So that could be a poll, a thread, uh, images, videos, or combination of all of those. So I've seen people use uh, these all into one thread. Um, and that could just be about anything to do that's STEM related. Um, that could be about your work. It could be about something you're interested in. So for me personally, um, I um, talked about how cereals were produced because that was my dad's uh, background. Uh, that's what he used to do. Um, so um, yeah, and you have a 10 minute slot. And then in July, uh, Sam collaborated with Minorities in STEM, which is a UK based organization, uh, which is uh, meant to be promoting the sort of the visibility of those working in STEM who are from ethnic minority backgrounds. And that meant, um, so for that show, um, um, it was for BAME or BIPOC presenters only, um, which, um, and, and at, at that point, I just, I asked if training might be something that he'd want to consider and whether I could do that. Um, and also um, another thing he also included in that was a support system so that they could get people to, um, they could go to for advice, people who participate in the show before or experience um, STEM communicators as well. So there was quite a bit of support there in terms of if they didn't want to attend training, they could still have someone they can go to, but they also had the option to attend training. What we found um, is that people signed up, some people signed up after doing training, not everybody did. I didn't expect lots of people to, but it did encourage more signups by providing training. Um, people could ask me questions. Um, by running live sessions, it's something where you commit an hour of your time to. So it's not like, oh, I'll read that thing later, you know, that, those resources later, or watch those videos later. They're committing to that time. Um, 
And uh, yeah, I also um, ran some training uh, more recently for um, LGBTQ STEM Day, um, as um, Sam ran a, a show for to celebrate the day. And so I ran a training session for LGBTQ uh, plus people working in STEM. Um, for that one, I did have to think a little bit differently because some of the participants for the show uh, may be doing it anonymously. And therefore I also wanted to um, make it so that you could attend this session anonymously. For this, I put conduct in place. I also had a moderator and I also had a recorded version. I thought a recorded version of the training session would be a good thing anyway, because I find that some people in the past have not been able to attend training uh, because of time zones, but also just because they've not had a good internet connection that day. And it means that they can actually access the training whenever they like. So it was good from, uh, from the accessibility point of view anyway. I should also mention that these two training sessions were offered to everyone um, of that particular demographic, whether they were planning to participate in the global science show or not. So it meant that lots of people can um, you know, still benefit even if they don't um, participate in the show. And the likelihood is that they might participate in the show at a different month. So you know, even if they couldn't join that month, they still joined at another point. Um, I, I, I felt that, well, I found really interesting. I remember thinking about the, the one I did for BAME and the IPOC folk in July, is that I had people who I thought were skilled already in STEM communication. And I thought, what are you doing here in a beginner session? And so this is where you could have people who have no experience whatsoever. But there's also some people who had that experience who I thought, yeah, you'd be good enough to do the Global Science Show. And it's just sometimes just that little push just that that's sometimes what it is, is that little push. Um, but also some people may feel like, well, actually, I've never had formal STEM communication training and having the opportunity to do that can be quite good. Um, some things to think about, though, when running the sessions, I remember um, I'm at, um, bleh, mentioned some things already around inc um, thinking about inclusion. Um, I think the other speakers have also covered this really well. Um, but just some other things to add. Um, if it is a long session, make sure you add in breaks make sure that people uh, kind of actually know what to expect as well. So if there is gonna be breakout, set, um, break, um, breakout rooms, is that the right word? Yes. Um, but also if, they, um, if a laptop might be a bit easier to use, if there's, let's say multiple screens, but also don't assume what devices they might have as well. So for example, using the chat box, it's not always easy to use a chat box if you're using your phone, for example. So make sure you have flexibility in how you deliver your training. Um, what other things that I want to mention here? Um, also make it a friendly environment to come into. It is still not quite, it's still not quite the same as attending sessions uh, in person. Um, and it can still feel a little bit strange and a bit disconnected. So one of the things that I do at the start of a session uh, was people coming in is ask a low stakes question. And I remember seeing Jamie Gallagher do this months ago uh, where he asked, what was the last animal you saw? and uh, got people to type in the chat. And it was just flooded with cat because a lot of people were just seeing cats that day. Uh, but it was a really good way to kind of introduce people into the session and say, um, so he, you know, use the chat box uh, and kind of get them used to doing that. And then maybe I would do a follow-up question like, oh, where are you from? Um, where are you talking to us from today? Um, so yeah, just try to find ways in which they can feel comfortable. If they want to ask a question anonymously, they can directly message you or you can use other electronic form. Um, so like I use idea boards, people use Slido, Padlet. There's lots of different options out there depending on um, what uh, you need. Um, also make sure that, um, that people feel like they can step away at any point, even in an hour session, stuff goes on at home and that just say, look, if you miss something, it's totally fine. Just let me know and I can catch you up and just so that people don't feel so tied to the computer. Um, another thing I have also done as also a freelancer, so it's nice to know there are other freelancers here too, is and think about, well, I've run some one hour sessions for free, but at the end of the day, I'm a freelancer. So um, Hannah Ayub and I um, ran a Cycle 101 session about a month ago and we made it pay what you can. So we still got paid, um, but we found that there, there, we had people contacting us saying, sorry, I can't pay the full amount. So it actually, it meant that we weren't excluding individuals by actually giving a range of different prices that they could pay. And that has been something I'm really glad I've done. And it's something I would like to do again. Um, I realize that my time is running out, um, but I think that's kind of what I wanted to cover. But basically think about providing support, whether that's training. Um, also, the other thing is if you are providing training, 
make sure they're signposted to do something with that training. What is something they can use their skills afterwards? Because otherwise they could just be left with that and it could be a long time before they actually use the skills and knowledge that they gain from your session. So whatever it is, signpost them to something, but also within networks, I don't want to always see the same people doing STEM communication. And how do we make sure that we can, you know, we know this person's done this thing or has been trained this thing. How do we make sure we get those opportunities for everyone and not just the same individuals each time? So yeah, that's me. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was all really useful. Um, one thing I will mention on some of the things that Sarah in particular, but other people were saying as well, some of those um, bits of technology that help you make things accessible and inclusive. We covered in the T-Mail session way back in May, I think it was, about doing stuff online. So um, we have a link to the very useful document that was produced at that point. Um, please do carry on updating that if you have found other things or if the information is now slightly up date because things have been updated since May. Um, and I think we have a link to that that we can probably paste into the chat. But if we don't, it is on the, there it is. Um, it is all on our website, so you can access that there.